Hello? Hi, this is uh, Bin from ANC. Hey, Bin. Good morning. Oh, good yeah, let's good let's give it another couple of minutes. Yeah. More people to join. All right, looks like uh, today may not have a very large audience. So, but uh, yeah, thank you for uh, joining us and excited to be here and hear about your project, Fogflow. And yeah, just we want to learn more about it uh, and how that fits into the cloud native ecosystem. Uh, yeah, then we're happy to learn and 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 um, just session is recorded too so for somebody else who wants to you know come in later they, they can actually see it too so yeah go ahead okay so i, I can share my screen huh? i i yeah. prepared a few slides uh, so i would like to go through the slides and also have some discussion with all of you uh, first thank you for inviting me to this session uh, also, it's my pleasure to introduce what I've been doing in terms of a workflow. So today, um, yes, this is a project I have been working on many for many years. Uh, so it's really my pleasure to introduce this to you. Um, so workflow, uh, it is a um, you can call it the edge computing framework or fork computing framework uh, to support uh, IoT applications on top of this cloud and edge environments. Uh, so it has a special kind of capability to support uh, applications with advanced, advanced uh, programming model. And also it is a runtime system to support such a programming model and also optimize the deployment of uh, IoT services. So I will give a little bit more detail. So let's uh, start with a little bit background. Um, so I have been working in the lab uh, for this project for uh, many, many years. Uh, so I'm from uh, AC Lab Europe. We are located in Heidelberg, uh, Germany. Uh, so we initiated this project uh, nearly four to five years ago. Right now, it has been an open source project based on the prototype we built before. Uh, so we are from an uh, IoT area, um, which means so we collect data from sensors and do some data processing and then derive some timely results situations so that uh, actuator, which is also a device, can re react on the results. So we the major thing we did is to uh, to be able to run such data processing in between the sensors and actuators. So in the old age, this type of data processing can be supported uh, by different type of big data processing frameworks like Hadoop, 
for batch processing, Spark store, store for stream processing. Nowadays, Flink could also combine both with a unified programming model and everything works very well in a cluster environment. That was the way we do before. But nowadays, uh, since the system architecture also changed and also their kind of uh, requirements in terms of uh, latency and also privacy and the cost uh, in order to support large scale IoT service. So we have to adapt to this type of new uh, requirements and also adapt to the new uh, environment. In this environment, we call it cloud edge environment. That means it is highly distributed and also have this hierarchy uh, with different uh, resource computation resource, uh, including resource in the clouds and some computation resource located at uh, IoT gateways uh, that can be deployed on the street or in the factory. So with this kind of uh, highly distributed architecture, in order to deploy uh, IoT services, we are basically facing two types of challenges. So the first one is to, to program uh, kind of for such IoT services uh, first. Then we can, and then according to that, uh, we can easily deploy them to this uh, highly distributed infrastructure without having too much uh, management complexity. So what we did is to uh, improve uh, or to overcome the complexities of uh, from both sides. One is to have this uh, easy to use programming model, we call it intent-based programming model to program uh, edge applications. On the other hand, to have uh, some kind of efficient framework to be able to manage uh, the task so first translate the programming model into concrete deployments uh, uh, plan and then also optimize the plan um, without having too much involvement from the users or, or system operate. So that, that are two type of focus we, we do in workflow. So there are a few uh, principles uh, that we try to follow in our design. By the way, if you have any question, just interrupt me um, so we can have some discussion. Yeah, sounds good. Yeah. So there's a few uh, kind of uh, principles we try to follow in the design of workflow. So the first part is uh, we try to decouple this uh, kind of computation logic, how we represent the service, uh, the design phase, and also the deployment requirements that we may face at the runtime uh, when we start to use the service. So that is the, this decoupling strategy we, we try to follow. And there's some consideration behind this uh, principle because um, for the same kind of uh, service, which may be a same pipeline, but uh, the way to trigger this pipeline may, be may need to be different according to how we use it. Uh, for example, if we use it for simulation, uh, you know, kind of cloud environment, we may not care about too much about the latency. Um, so we may want to just reduce the cost to use the resource for doing that. Uh, if we trigger such service, uh, some pipeline for some kind of uh, device, then the time may be important. We like to get this result as soon as possible. So um, that's why we kind of uh, separate out the, the, this uh, computation logic to represent it as a kind of uh, graph, which, composes, which consists of multiple uh, data processing units each one we call the task. Um, and then on the other hand, uh, we have this kind of de deployment requirements, we call it intent. This basically represents uh, how would you like to trigger such computation logic uh, from different perspective, like whether you want to trigger that for a large amount of data or a small part of the data or some kind of uh, service level objective we would like to achieve. 
So I will come to that thing of, uh, later. So this is first uh, principle in our design. And second principle, we try to make the data visible, the, the data between tasks. So in like uh, Spark, Hadoop, the data is basically, uh, it's, it's not only to the specific uh, application developer, but it's not open to everyone to share. So that means uh, this interoperability and also capabilities to share the task or the data processing logic is limited because you don't know which type of input data you need for the task, which type of output data that could be produced by the task. So we try to make then kind of uh, standardize uh, based on some common uh, data model, so make it visible to, to share. And also uh, around time, we try to leverage this type of information for the orchestration of the application or the service. Uh, another question, so the intent mm -hmm. basically uh, the, the way you uh, compute the the steps on on a on a DAC or or, or that yep. that would be okay. So and then, so that actually means the trigger too, right? So or the trigger happens um, at, at the DAC level or it happens at the intent level. But when the trigger for the computation? Yeah, yeah, that is the trigger, uh, including some kind of specific or uh, customizable requirement, but uh, this intent is a trigger. Got it, okay. Thanks. And then, yeah. Uh, so in terms of uh, programming model that we follow the same way as uh, this uh, Apache Flink does try to unify the programming model for different cases, uh, especially for this data incentive, uh, intensive for uh, IoT services, uh, data-oriented application. Uh, and then internally, we try to optimize this runtime deployment with, regarding to, with regard to the high-level service objective or constraints like optimize everything based on, um, to, in order to minimize the cost or in order to minimize the, the latency or even for machine learning application, you may consider to cover some application level requirement in terms of uh, accuracy. Uh, this is still ongoing and try to optimize the pipeline uh, by taking into account this application level requirements. Um, so at very high level, you can see that Forkflow is a runtime system. On the one hand, provides some interface for application developer to uh, structure their applications um, based on our intent-based programming model. It's basically to define this uh, computation logic as a graph. And then by taking that uh, into account, and then with this intent as a trigger, then this uh, Forkflow runtime system try to decide uh, how to construct the, the instance of the task and then how to configure the task and then where to deploy the task. Uh, in the end, we consider uh, several type of uh, contexts, uh, including the system context, uh, re available resource in the overall system, and then data context, uh, because we make this data visible based on some common data model. So then we also know exactly which type of data are available at which place. So this type of uh, metadata is also taking your account for the orchestration uh, task. And then the usage context is what I mean by intent. It's from the uh, user's perspective, how they would like to trigger the task. So we consider these three type of context to orchestrate this application uh, over this uh, distributed environment. Um, I think this is somehow yeah, self-explained. So as I explained before, we have a graph we call it service topology, which consists of multiple tasks with some um, data dependency. And then 
later this can be triggered by a, a defined uh, intent object. And just to mention the task, actually the task in the graph uh, refer to a operator. Operator is a Dockerized application, uh, which can take certain input and then do some data processing and then produce some output. Uh, the task is just try to annotate this uh, operator in the context of uh, service topology. Um, and then come to the point about intents. Uh, this is a, just a data structure that represent uh, covering different part of uh, requirement. like you define which to service topology you would like to trigger. And here's this kind of geoscope to fit out the data you would like to select and put into this computation logic. And then service level objective, uh, it's uh, re represent from different perspective where the, basically it's your optimization objective to run the task. Uh, defined from the cost perspective, lengthness perspective, or this accuracy perspective, if that is about uh, AI or machine learning pipeline. And then the priority of this task uh, um, for using the resource in the overall system. Um, yes, so then uh, let me give you a little bit of introduction about the system itself. Um, so this is a layered view of workflow system. Uh, so at the top layer, we have some interface or graphic user interface for the users to define uh, service uh, computation logic, which is the graph. Uh, and then the management layer, basically it's the core is the server topology master. Uh, topology master makes some decision based on the information come from this uh, discovery because discovery and broker, they are the core component for the data management layer. Um, so data is uh, will be managed by different broker at each age. Uh, and then reports which type of data can be available at the local uh, age. Report this to the discovery and discovery uh, give this information to the master for making decision um, about uh, how should, how, how we can plan the computation task, like basically figure out how many tasks we should prepare for each, uh, how many instances we should prepare to instantiate for each task in that graph and later then decide where to deploy. Uh, and then once decided where to deploy, then tell the worker to decide. Worker is basically is uh, to execute the command to or just uh, to, to launch the task. Uh, and then the lower layer is the, the data source layer or some device layer, which basically produce the data to the report to the system, but also consume data produced by the task, uh, the data processing task in the system. Um, so this may be more concrete than that layered view. Um, so basically in terms of deployment, we have uh, what we call it a workflow cloud node. Uh, this is kind of centralized part, uh, including all the core services we need for the set time workflow system, uh, including this uh, master for making the orchestration decision and discovery to report availability of the data in the system. Uh, and also this cloud node can also partially be uh, age node, um, which is more powerful with more resource, but normally this age node uh, located close to the users uh, like, uh, like an IoT gateway. For that, so on the edge node, we have only uh, two components, uh, one broker and one worker. Broker basically manage, manage the local data and worker received the commands from the central uh, master 
to decide uh, what to do uh, for launching the task and configure the task. And overall, there's a, uh, if I get come back here, here there are kind of basically two major channels. One is for this data management channel uh, between discovery and broker. On the other hand, uh, it's the control channel between uh, master and worker. Um, there, so for for that we have yeah we, we try to separate out because uh, combining we may have kind of a buffering issue to propagate this command uh, in real time uh, or as fast as we can. So we separate two channel uh, to make this control channel to be more efficient and fast. Uh, in terms of uh, data management in Forkflow, um, uh, as mentioned before, uh, so for each edge node, there's a broker to kind of uh, manage the local entity data, which represents some state or of device or just represent the entire uh, IoT device. Uh, and then the central discovery this index or this uh, availability of the data. So just one of the unique thing is uh, the data we kind of follow a standardized data model in this is what's in the context of Fivewell, uh, is the European uh, community for IoT system. So we define a standardized data model, it's called NGSI, but it covers two parts. One is this uh, NGSN 9 for managing the metadata part, uh, NGS 10 for manage the full entity data. Uh, both provide pops up interface. So Forkflow is built on top of that. Um, um, in terms of the last part, uh, how we orchestrate uh, this orchestrate the service, yeah. So uh, basically this uh, graph is given by this application developer. And then after receiving a trigger, which is uh, intent, and then the system start to figure out how to generate uh, this uh, execution plan, which consists of uh, uh, the concrete instance of each task and also this uh, concrete configuration in terms of which input data to put into which task and produce which type of output. And then this execution plan is just also a graph. And then the last step is to decide how to split up in this graph into different parts. So then we can deploy them to different uh, age note. This will be done by the workers, but to figure out how which task goes to which age node, this is done by the master in Forkflow. Uh, there's some optimization objective uh, in terms of uh, how we achieve this uh, service level objective. For example, minimize uh, some kind of cost of doing internal data uh, transmission or uh, provide the minimal latency between these uh, sensors to uh, sensors and actuators. Uh, so this optimization objective will be set up by this intent. Um, yes, then that is um, some key part of question the question. The, the uh, yeah, yeah, so, yes. yeah, so you have the execution plan and the that is actually running in the cloud system. Uh, and then the, later that when that gets comp computed and basically gets deployed or, or when you right. have creating a deployment plan and the deployment plan in, in the cloud system. And then after that's created, uh, then it gets actually deployed in the, in the edge environment. So uh, this uh, execution got, plan is calculated in the cloud. Okay. And then uh, that will be split up and then deployed. So de this uh, deployment plan is actually also calculated by this optimization algorithm in the cloud and then just executed by the worker. So worker in, just passively yes, receive yeah, what yeah. to do. 
Okay, got it. Okay, got it. Yeah, so this is uh, right now the, 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 the open source version. Uh, we know that uh, there's a bottleneck uh, in terms of uh, calculate this uh, uh, execution plan and also figure out how to deploy because this is done in a centralized way right now. Uh, so th that's why no, also we have some kind of distributed version to do this uh, orchestration decision uh, uh, in, uh, in kind of a distributed manner. Um, so yeah. That is a more advanced version that uh, we, we, we haven't really released uh, to this yeah, another, open source company. Yeah, so another question would be like uh, something like the execution plan and deployment plan could be maybe run something like Kubernetes that you could auto scale, right? Like um, if, you, if you need more capacity, to create that execution plan, you can uh, provision that on, on, on demand, right? So, uh, uh, right, right. So that's that's correct. Um, here, uh, it's kind of one layer on top of uh, Kubernetes, um, but definitely to deploy this uh, uh, deployment plan, we can leverage uh, Kubernetes uh, as well, like, uh, try to deploy this. So right now we, we just integrate with Docker engine directly, uh, mm -hmm. but for the cloud node, definitely we can benefit from uh, Kubernetes because uh, we don't, Flow doesn't have to manage this uh, resource uh, in terms of container. So the, the orchestration of container, this can be managed by Kubernetes. Uh, so, only we do this uh, calculation on how to figure out this execution plan. Once we figure out that, uh, we can rely on Kubernetes to, to, to carry out this uh, deployment plan. But the optimization is still done in workflow. Got it. Thank you. So on another question about this slide, so you have the graphical editor on the left side. Is, it, is this part of Fogflow or, or this is? Yeah, uh, yes. Okay. okay, so you can create like a, your dependency graph and everything using Fogflow. Right, and also we have a graphic user interface to do this. Uh, so right now you have to manually input this data type or, so in the next version, we try to introduce a kind of type management system because in Folkflow, the data model is standardized. So we, we, we know what are the types of data types we have. Uh, so we also manage that. So in the end, then later, this um, annotation of your task in the graph uh, will be easier to define by using this maintained uh, type data type system. Got it. Thank you. Uh, yes. Yeah, so uh, after talking all of this, uh, here is a yeah, it's more uh, simple example. Uh, we call it lost child finding, and I know this is a uh, for sure a problem maybe in US because of privacy. Uh, it was a use case uh, uh, come up with uh, by by business unit in Japan uh, in CSZ Japan. Japanese company. Uh, so the scenario is to identify a lost child uh, in a big event like Olympic um, in some area which has uh, many different studios located. And if the child is lost, then the parents can ask help from the staff member and the staff member can never this uh, age computing infrastructure uh, to find out the child quickly uh, because uh, many cameras and age gateway will be deployed a different location uh, in this area. And then we can structure a simple application logic. Uh, this is a service topology, but has only one uh, task, uh, which is a face matching. This task just take the image of lost child provided by the parents and look at the video uh, stream from each camera and then to match that with the uh, image of the lost child. If it's identified from the video, then it just reports yes. 
and this task will be instantiated um, a different location uh, according to where the camera is located, where this edge load have been has been deployed uh, in this area. And to trigger that, we need to define an intent object to say uh, this uh, service has the highest priority and we like to achieve minimal latency for doing this. Uh, then the system will understand uh, even occupy the other resource to, to do this uh, highly urgent task. Um, and then, uh, and then uh, another question. So, so this, this will happen in real time, basically so you specify the intent and then you will schedule that to start doing the face matching and then, and then look around uh, through all the edge nodes that have cameras, right? To try to do that face matching. Uh, uh, yes, yeah, it's, it's more or less like that. But uh, if you remember in the previous slides, we have also a scope, which is part of the intent. Uh, we can define, select a specific area, which is the scope in this intent. Then we execute this, uh, this service for that scope first. And then, in, and in this case, the scope will be what the just a just an area in the on the map. Got it. Got it. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. So the the normal development process for for uh, to to implement the for flow service will be like this because uh, that's basically maybe I can skip this because here it's more easy to follow. It's easier to follow. So there are three main elements in order to program a workflow service. First, uh, which is this uh, operate. Uh, so in that specific uh, scenario is this face matching um, data processing unit. This need to be programmed as a Docker Dockerized application. And then we register that, register that uh, to the system as a reusable operator. And then second step is the application developer basically to use the graphic interface to construct this graph by linking multiple tasks together. And then this design phase is finished and then come to the operating phase and then whenever we send uh, we define uh, intent and then issue that intent to workflow system and then we will be able to trigger in the workflow system to deploy a service uh, this uh, deploy the service for what you have already asked in this uh, intent object mm -hmm. um, so these are main three step uh, to do uh, so for implement, uh, implementing our operator, we provide different um, temperature for different programming language, um, but the core part is uh, just to implement this function. Uh, for the developer of the operator, you don't have to care about the other part, only to say you, have, you will receive this type of input data and then perform your internal data processing logic. If you have some data to report back to the system, and you can use the publish and callback function to publish the result back to the system. And the other two are optional. If this input data provided by Folkflow system, uh, it's not enough. You need to uh, query or subscribe some extra information, then you can use the other two uh, functions. Otherwise, it's not needed. Um, this yeah, pattern, then, uh, sorry, the questions here. So, so this pattern can be also be used in maybe serverless type of uh, frameworks? Uh, yes, you... Uh, you, you are definitely right. So uh, I didn't mention here because um, we also have a simplified uh, programming model, which is called fork function. Uh, the fork function is a special case of uh, 
one serv service topology, which is very simple, uh, contains only one task plus a default uh, intent. This default intent is just to do, uh, like to do this for the entire system scope and with always minimal uh, latency. So that is a special case. But the idea behind this is like service computing. You just need to implement this function and then uh, function will be deployed whenever the data you need became available in the system. Uh, it. It's also slightly different from the, the traditional service func uh, computing because uh, here the triggering is only based on the availability of the data we require. Uh, but for the traditional service computing, you need to have an event. This event can be a HTTP request, which provide the input data, or can be some storage system. So, which is a more kind of generic. And in workflow case, uh, we we borrow the idea of service computing, but it's a need more specific to data oriented and only trigger that when the data you required became available in the system. Okay, so that is, uh, and then the second step is to define this uh, service topology. As I mentioned before, we have this uh, graphic user interface to compose uh, this graph with multiple tasks together. Uh, and then we also provide this user interface to define our service in this intent, uh, which right now cover this different perspective. This polygon is to specify a scope uh, to trigger this uh, computation logic defined by the service topology. Yeah, those are main steps, three steps to to work out a uh, workflow application service. And right now, uh, this, uh, we have a detailed tutorial provided by this link. Uh, so if you are interested, you can get more information from here. Uh, also, now we are kind of uh, support uh, the community of the workflow users. Uh, there are some kind of adoption happens uh, in both uh, academia and also industry. Uh, for example, uh, there's some um, provider of uh, gateway provider. They already designed this uh, hardware, which already have workflow deployed on the board. Um, also, yes. So we got another full request from researchers from different university because they figure out uh, workflow is easy to extend. Uh, for different idea, especially uh, some optimization of this orchestration for data oriented uh, applications in this cloud edge environment. Uh, so overall, uh, we are kind of promoting the workflow in this five-year community. Uh, I mentioned the very beginning. So here, uh, I have a little bit more to say about community of five well. It is mainly driven by this European um, countries um, for IoT in general, uh, including in different areas, like many smart city and now also smart industry. So what we do in this community is to have this ecosystem, open source ecosystem um, to support uh, IoT in general. As you see in this uh, diagram, so in this community, uh, th there are so many different uh, open source uh, projects. Uh, they maintain or develop components for different uh, um, um, features, like for management, for data management, uh, interface with devices, and for security, and for data processing uh, visualization. So Fortflow is one open source component in this chapter uh, in terms of the data processing. Um, we also yeah, uh, 
kind of promote business together with all the other partners in this community. Uh, in terms of uh, research, uh, yeah, by looking ahead, uh, we are uh, currently extending this uh, orchestration to have uh, distributed, or we call it autonomous orchestration, means uh, this orchestration not just carry out in the clouds uh, in a centralized way, but can be carried out, uh, distributed uh, by the local age as well, but uh, they are able to collaborate with the other uh, system. And um, compared with the other existing uh, like edge computing framework or, or full computing framework, as Folkflow is kind of more data oriented because it based on a standardized data model we call NGSI. Uh, because of that, uh, it has an opportunity to support uh, kind of data sharing platform. Uh, so here we are also exploring uh, using uh, Folkflow to support secure data sharing platform uh, among different um, uh, enterprises. Uh, for example, they can also enforce how uh, different users can consume the data uh, based on some kind of data usage control policy. Uh, it will be a federated setup of Folkflow, um, but we also extend this intent to cover the constraint of uh, data usage uh, in different scenario. And in more long-term, we try to uh, kind of cover this application level requirements um, like uh, machine learning task in terms of accuracy. So we can also optimize the pipeline uh, with regard to this accuracy of machine learning pipeline task. Uh, yeah, here's a summary. Uh, it's, I, today I mentioned the overall design principle of workflow and also introduced some of the key parts like this intent-based programming model and orchestrating the service based on the defined intent and also some, um, some way to do this optimization according to this defined service level objective in the intent programming model. Um, as there's a community for Forkflow, we try to support it with our best efforts. Um, yeah, hopefully we can leverage Forkflow to support more application in both uh, in the 5G area for future application or for AI application in this context of data sharing uh, platform. Um, yeah, that's all from my side. Uh, if you have a question, yeah, I, we can have a, more discussion. Thanks. Yeah, thank you for the presentations. That's very interesting. Uh, yeah, I have a question about the, um, the future in, in terms of uh, deployment. It, are there any plans to uh, have some sort of reference architecture around Kubernetes and, and, and to deploy some of the, uh, the workloads and I mean at the edge and also in the cloud running on top of Kubernetes or that's not in the plan yet? It is a, in our short-term plan. Uh, so right now every, this integration is only based on Docker engine. Uh, one, one of our ongoing tasks is to replace this part uh, with uh, Kubernetes API. Right, right. So especially for the cloud node part, because then uh, we we just rely on this uh, Kubernetes uh, setup then to launch uh, part of the deployment plan. If we say this part of the deployment plan is to be carried out on the air, on 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 the cloud node uh, on the cloud part, then this will be done automatically by using Kubernetes API. So then we don't have to worry about uh, like reliability or restart the, this uh, Docker when there's something wrong. So this will be very well supported by Kubernetes. This is uh, the, the cloud node part, cloud part, but the edge part we consider to use um, this uh, lightweight Kubernetes uh, It's called uh, K3S. We are just investigating 
well uh, that is that provide the similar API as uh, the official Kubernetes. Um, yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, K3S is also a CNCF project. Um, yeah. And I have a, another question about the secure data sharing platform. Is it is this going to, going to be a, a, a hosted service as a platform, or is this just going to be more of a um, software that people could run and basically, you know, set up their own data sharing platform, maybe in so, a federate, federated yeah, way? Mm -hmm. Yes, but, you know, it basically it will be in a federated uh, environment. For example, you know, in Europe, people talk about this, uh, this IDSA is international data space. There's a big uh, kind of construction about this. Also about the, the, like this Gaiot X, which is this uh, cloud computing vision of Europe, uh, because you know Europe is quite fragmented. Uh, so this infrastructure is also need to be federated. So in terms of this uh, data sharing platform, we are thinking that uh, so different uh, company or different countries, they will be able to host uh, their part of this uh, data sharing platform. And then there's some kind of uh, process that uh, to authenticate who can join this kind of uh, data sharing platform and how they can uh, communicate with each other. So right now, because there's no kind of uh, agreement about the common data model between different uh, hosted system. Uh, so it just, uh, then people decide to go to this uh, up level. So this interoperability between different hosted platform can be based on semantic. Uh, it is a much higher level because then there's no need to say what specific data model you need to have as long as this data is can be represented as a meaningful, in a meaningful way, like uh, RDF or, or some kind of semantic related technology. That was the result of um, because uh, it's hard to have a common agreement on the Pacific data model. It's also competition between different companies. Uh, so Fullflow can play just one role because uh, the other company can also provide kind of data sharing platform as long as they can get certificate from this, uh, this consortium. So every company can, can provide uh, some kind of implementation uh, for this data sharing platform. Yeah, you know, I think uh, one of the things that I thought about was the data privacy, right? So- uh, They have some, yeah, some kind of regulation so basically this organization should be able to check uh, which type of security or the usage control you can provide when they start to check your system and uh, give you a certificate, they will check uh, whether you can provide this type of uh, privacy guarantee or that level. So they have some kind of brim, uh, blueprint, but uh, it's still ongoing because uh, carry out this in practice, it's actually not easy. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Well, anybody else has more questions? Again, we got Alina, so. I just wanted to thank um, Ben for, for the awesome presentation and uh, a very interesting use case of a lost child. And uh, happy to see that the project is considering using Kubernetes and K3S as a backend, a K3S has a, exactly the same API as Kubernetes, so shouldn't be any compatibility issues. Yes, we are also yeah, very happy to really integrate with Kubernetes uh, because we see that has really generating a big impact um, in the community, especially for cloud computing. And we see if we move Fullflow to a production level, then we have to integrate with Kubernetes. Yeah. So uh, have a, um, I have a question here. Uh, so what is the, I'm, I, I'm not very familiar with uh, CNCF overall. 
so what is the this uh, general interest of different uh, interest group uh, in under this C uh, cloud uh, native computing foundation uh, so uh, your question was more about this uh, Sigrun time or some other interest groups, right? It's that just is. for uh, this uh, uh, discussion and to, to know uh, this uh, latest progress, or do you have some specific targets um, for each interest group to? Yeah, so I, I think the, um, the main roles of the six, um, who are part of the TOC, sort of like an extension of the TOC. The TOC stands for Technical Oversight Committee. Um, and Alina is one of the members of the TOC. So uh, the TOC uh, makes decisions about projects that want to join the foundation uh, and then also sets a framework uh, for these projects on maturity level. Uh, whether this project is entry level, like uh, more like sandbox, more like incubation, or more like uh, uh, there's a, the level, the highest level is graduated, which means it's widely adopted in the industry and um, has a, a certain number of users. So they set up all this framework for projects, right, and 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 also to work with the communities and and how they can grow them and how they can. Uh, be, uh, get more adoption, right? So, Same. yeah, and then so the six are an extension of this TOC, and uh, so there's a SIG runtime, there's a SIG um, observability, there's a SIG um, uh, uh, application delivery. So for different areas, uh, so this is just SIG runtime, and it's mostly about workloads in the cloud. Um, Kubernetes is in, is in the scope in this SIG too. Uh, but there are some other projects like uh, AI type of projects or, or container runtimes. Mm -hmm. And so, so the, the goal of the SIG is engaging the communities. Uh, so we have these meetings uh, every two months, uh, or every, sorry, every month, every, twice. So every two mm -hmm. weeks. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, and, 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 and engage the community so they get interested in the CSDF projects and start using more of these projects. Uh, some of these projects also join the foundation too. So uh, the idea is just to engage also other projects where we might have gaps in, in the cloud native ecosystem. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, they might want to join the foundation too. And then, so we're happy to, to help uh, in that uh, aspect. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. thanks. Uh, thanks. Uh, I, thanks for the uh, introduction. Yeah. I, I'm quite new to this community, uh, but uh, yeah, to be honest, I think this is really very cool community that we see it's growing very fast and moving fast. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So we're happy to have you involved. I know you, you're you part of Fireware, so I mean, you're uh, part of a different community, but uh, uh, it's open source, so um, mm -hmm. anybody's welcome to participate and contribute and, and get engaged. So. Okay, great, great. Thanks. Uh, also, yeah, thank you for the invitation. We were really excited to report Forkflow here. Yeah. Yeah, we're glad that you decided to present and happy to learn. And yeah, hopefully, uh, then we get more, you get more adoption and also uh, the space actually keeps on growing. So. All right. So, yeah. Um, have a great rest of your day and yeah, we'll see you next time or? Okay, yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.